Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the first of two sessions on uh, research in databases. As I said earlier, my goal is to have an interactive session, but I thought I would uh, get started by having a few slides which uh, talk about my view of how to go about doing research. There are of course many other views, each researcher would have their own view. So you should talk to other researchers and uh, find out which view uh, you agree with and perhaps follow that. But I'll take uh, the first uh, five to ten minutes to uh, put up a few slides and uh, then we'll have a lot more discussion. Uh, but before I start, maybe I can take one or two questions about research just to get a feel for what is it that people are looking for in this session? What, what do you want out of this session? So if uh, there's anyone who is uh, ready for interaction, um, maybe I will pick up a few. So the, uh, we are with EBET group. Tamil Nadu. If you have uh, some introductory questions, please go ahead. Sir, uh, actually if you are doing research means uh, we have to extract lot of data from the database. So if you are extracting data from the database means uh, which kind of language is efficient? Okay. So the question is, uh, does supposing you want to extract a lot of data from a database, uh, what language is efficient? Now that's not exact necessarily what research is about. Research is about doing anything innovative. Now the amount of data you need for it could be very small or it could be very large. And depending on what kinds of things you want to do, uh, just Java, JDBC with SQL is good enough for many, many things and that's been the focus of most of what I have done. Um, for certain things we have used uh, C++. And uh, these days, uh, to deal with big data which spans many machines, there are tools which we use. In particular, uh, Hadoop is something that we are going to cover uh, later in this course. So uh, you have to use the right tools for whatever job you are doing. Uh, luckily, there are uh, lots of tools uh, in the open source community which are very good quality tools used by industries also. Uh, so you just have to pick uh, the right tools once you know what uh, specific area you want to work in. Okay, we are with Tyagarajar College, Madurai. Now, normally in authentication, we are using password and um, username and password. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to increase the security mm -hmm. so that we can add location also? Okay. Is there any uh, yeah. I, I, possibilities are there? Sir? Yeah. So, uh, there are many tools out there to improve uh, the security of authentication. Username and password is actually very weak, uh, although that is the primary mode used today. Uh, there are so many ways in which it can be attacked. People can guess passwords, people can install uh, keystroke loggers on various computers which uh, record the passwords which you have typed in. Uh, but people have also worked on solutions to some of these problems, um, including uh, sending a one-time password by SMS. which is widely used in India now for credit card transactions. Uh, there are also um, some other ways of uh, checking where you are log where you have logged in from. So the IP address from which you have logged in, if the bank knows that you normally log in from a certain range of IP addresses, uh, which is based in a certain location, if you suddenly log in from somewhere else, uh, that is probably an alert. So this is where location comes in. So if uh, State Bank of India is uh, getting a request to transfer money from China and you know it should probably take some extra precautions to uh, make sure that it's not fraudulent. Uh, what can it do uh, in such cases? We don't know. I mean there are various things an application could do such as totally ban things from a certain area or uh, you know maybe allow it but subject to limitations on what kind of things you can do. Um, so, the location uh, could be inferred from an IP address in such cases. Uh, there are uh, many more things such as uh, you have hardware uh, tokens uh, which will generate a new number each time uh, depending on the time. So if you don't have that physical device, you don't have the correct password to be used at that point in time. So there are many things which people use. Uh, so overall, uh, you know, it's clearly a major problem. Is it a research area? Yes. No, it's not a database research area. Uh, people have uh, looked at it as a research area in other communities. Um, so, p 
people have talked for, about for example, biometrics. Biometrics is very good when uh, you go to a place and uh, say you go to a bank or a ration shop and they want to identify who you are. But if you are doing it over the net, uh, biometrics does not work because uh, you know thing it is vulnerable to recording and replay and so forth. So, if somebody gives a biometric over the net, there is no way to verify if, whether somebody recorded it and is replaying it or it is a genuine person. So, there are many issues here. Um, so, there is a whole community looking at this. It is I am not much familiar with the details. Okay, any other research related uh, issues, questions you want to ask? So, I am working on a temporal database. So, is uh, any uh, website uh, where I can find this such type of uh, data related with time series data, sir? Okay. So, that is a again uh, let me generalize that question. Whatever area you are working in, it is very important uh, today to get uh, data sets in that area. So, that is something that people are looking out for all the time. So, where can you get uh, good data sets for uh, such research? Um, so, that is not an easy question to answer in general. In the data mining community, there are many uh, data sets which have been put up by various people. Um, there is a site called kdnuggets.com which provides uh, sample data sets for many applications. Uh, in fact, they do not provide it themselves, they provide links to other sites that provide data sets. Uh, recently, I heard about this uh, startup called Kaggle, it is a company which will uh, give you data sets and a problem and uh, you can uh, come up with solutions uh, for predicting something, like this is specifically about data mining. Um, and prediction. So, they give you a data set and a prediction problem and uh, so the idea is that anybody who wants can download those data sets and they give uh, some test data meaning, um, so they give a training data and then you can test if your prediction was correct on some other test data. And so, that could be a source of data sets, I have not tried it myself. Uh, so, there are other sources, I, I can't give you a generic thing. So, specifically for temporal data, I do not know. I mean, but the good thing today is uh, Google is the great equalizer. Uh, you can search on Google just as well as I can. It is not just Google, of course, any search engine. Um, so, you, if you just spend enough time trying different queries, uh, generally you will hit upon a few uh, interesting uh, data sets. Uh, it is not a general, it may not always work, but it often does. So, I do not have a specific answer, sorry. Sir, what is the implication of applying data analytics to a database? Is there any tool to formulate data analytics? Data analytics is a general area which is you have data, you want to analyze it to come up with interesting conclusions which you can then uh, use to drive your business. So, it is a very big area both in terms of uh, you know commercial uh, prospects and uh, in terms of research that has gone into it. And it has many sub areas, you, it, the earliest forms were online analytical processing which let analysts uh, view various aggregates on the data, look at it in different ways. Um, you can drill down, uh, you know roll up, uh, you know, there is a whole number of operations uh, which these tools provided to let you look at aggregates in different ways. And eventually from that figure out. Uh, you know what is going on and uh, find interesting things which could uh, help you in making business decisions. Later uh, this moved to uh, data mining and uh, people have been applying data mining algorithms to find patterns which could be useful in making business decisions. So, this is a very rich area, there is a lot of scope still, there has been a lot of work on data mining by no means is the area new, it has been around for since the mid 90s and in fact, it has an older history uh, from the machine learning community in AI which is much older. So, there is a long history to it, uh, but uh, as of today you know I think it is still a rich area in the sense that uh, there are many more problems which have not been studied in uh, great depth. So, there is still potential for interesting work to be done. Okay, I think what I will do now is uh, go through the uh, slides which I have. Uh, and then again we will have a discussion, uh, maybe this will help in some way. So, what is research? If you see the uh, Oxford English Dictionary definition, it is a systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. That is a long sentence, uh, but there are a few uh, key things to note here. 
Uh, the first is uh, you want to reach new conclusions. So you want to do something new. Uh, the second, so this is a very generic definition across many areas of research, uh, ranging from you know the humanities, research in humanities to research in sciences. So again, uh, what is relevant to computer science, what parts of this are relevant to computer science are not exactly what are relevant. For example, it says study of materials and sources. Okay, so uh, materials are not so important. Sources are only important in the sense of finding ideas. Uh, whereas in humanities, the sources are what the research is about in many cases. So from, a, from the perspective of computer science at least, uh, what is research? It could be many things, but here are a couple of attempts to say what it could be. One thing that research could be is to solve a problem in an innovative way. So that, here is the problem. Uh, here are some solutions uh, which work, but we are not happy with it. Uh, let's find a new way of uh, solving it and uh, you know that's research but of course a new way doesn't necessarily mean a better way so along with coming up with an idea of how to do something uh, how to solve a problem uh, you also have to compare with uh, things which have been proposed earlier for the same problem so you need to be able to uh, do a comparison with earlier solutions sometimes it could be uh, qualitative but more often it uh, needs to be quantitative to show that what you have done works Another way of uh, doing research would be to read up what is there and find an existing published solution. So here is a solution. Uh, it is a solution to some problem. Now if you read most papers carefully, you will realize that in order to solve the problem, in, uh, they make a lot of assumptions. Most research papers make lots and lots of assumptions to simplify life. So a rich source of uh, you know, doing research is to look at these things and find out hey, what simplifying assumptions have they made, uh, which maybe we can generalize. So if you remove some assumption, then let us see how we can extend the solution to solve it in this case. Uh, so uh, improving, so what I would call this is uh, improving on existing solutions to extend them. So this could also be research. Of course, there are many, many more definitions of research, um, but let us see how to go about this process of research. So I would say there are three key steps in this process. The first is to find a research area or areas. So that is the very first step which anybody who is starting off on a PhD needs to do. What area to work on? Now many times there is a shortcut solution to this which is to find a guide and then work on whatever problem the guide suggests. Of course then it is a guide's problem to find a research area. Uh, but regardless of uh, whether you have a guide to tell you a, to work on an area or not, you should explore. Part of doing a PhD is to explore. And when I say explore, what I mean is to find out what people are doing, what is going on in the world of research. So how do you do this exploration? Uh, so the typical way you would do this is to find out uh, what are the areas of interest in recent years. It does not have to be this year, it does not have to be last year, maybe in the last few years. Uh, why do I say this? Because anybody who uh, reads a textbook on operating systems gets thrilled by some of the ideas there uh, and do not realize that those ideas are uh, 30, 40 years old and a lot of research happened in that era and it is very hard to uh, you know, come up with brand new ideas in that area. Databases is a somewhat younger area, but even in databases now there are many things which were uh, looked at in great detail many years ago. Uh, so it is a lot of work to uh, figure out what you can do new in those areas. So a shortcut is to find out what areas people are looking at currently uh, and hopefully some of those have not been explored in as much depth as an area which is 30 years old. But that said, uh, there are, uh, what happens often is an area was explored 30 years ago, but not in depth. And there are new issues which have come up which makes it revis worth revisiting uh, 30 year old areas. Things which you study about in uh, basic uh, textbooks, you might want to relook at some of these in the light of something new. So if we say query processing techniques um, uh, or let us take an even simpler case, uh, storage and indexing techniques which we are going to look at tomorrow, uh, they were all designed for disk systems and a few for main memory databases. Uh, these days there is flash memory uh, which is now 
very widely used. So, there was a lot of people who looked at, uh, you know, here is a new technology. How will it affect all these solutions which people have come up with over these years? And can we change what we do for various things? Uh, and more recently, uh, there have been proposals for other kinds of memories called storage class memory, uh, which are persistent, but give an interface much like random access memory. And people have been looking at how do we build storage and index structures for these kinds of memories. Flash has certain properties, these have certain other properties. So, uh, revisiting old areas in the light of some new technologies is definitely a, uh, a good way to find a research area. Uh, but if you read papers uh, from these things, you will find people have looked at some of these areas. And if some area excites you, probably worth looking at in more detail. Uh, so, where do you look for these papers? Where do you go and start searching? A good heuristic is to look at uh, the top conferences in an area. So, if you uh, uh, focus on databases, some of the top conferences are the ACM SIGMOD conference, the very large database or VLDB conference, uh, there is IEEE international conference on data engineering, ICDE, then there is EDBT, ICDT, which are uh, European conferences. And then there are many, many more. So, these I would say are tier one, uh, which are the hardest to get papers into. And you do not necessarily want to try to get a paper into these conferences right away until uh, you have got a footing in the area. But there are also uh, tier uh, two slash three, the next level down uh, conferences, which are not as hard to get papers into. And, but they do have interesting papers, the good papers, which are worth reading and uh, seeing if you can uh, get ideas from those and follow up. So, these include uh, DASFA or, or, or the COMAD conference, uh, which we hold in India each year. It is an, an inter international conference with uh, participation from all over the world, but it is held in India, which makes it easy for everyone here to attend. The costs are kept very low. We keep the, uh, I am involved in it and we make sure to keep the registration fees very low. So, everybody should be able to attend. Um, it is more or less the cost of travel and uh, cost for a hotel in case of faculty. For students, uh, you know, we even arrange hostels to make it even cheaper or free. So, it is good to attend these things to find out where the buzz is. What are uh, top people in this area saying about uh, what they think are interesting problems to look at? So, somebody asked me before the talk, what are interesting research areas? Uh, so, there are many, many areas. And what you should do is uh, look at uh, maybe some of the keynote talks in some of these conferences, where people uh, talk about what they think are interesting areas to look at. Uh, there are also online talks, uh, some from these conferences, some from other places, uh, where people have talked about a research area, and it is worth uh, looking at those. Another way is uh, to ignore all the published literature, more or less, but go find real world problems. Um, and especially find those which are not solved satisfactorily. And then try to abstract them, so that there is some hope of solving them. So, how do we do this? Um, so, uh, so, there are, it is actually hard here. This is a little harder, because the line between development and research is not very clear. There are many real world problems, which do not lead to new research. They lead to new uh, tools, which you can build to solve them. But is that tool a research contribution, or is it just a tool which you built? It depends. There are tools which are sufficiently innovative that you would count them as research contributions. And then there are tools which are straightforward. You build a web app, that is probably not research. But then having built it, if you see how to stress it, how to scale it, how to do various other things, how to solve new problems that uh, you know, seem very hard to solve efficiently how to solve them more efficiently. Usually, any real world problem that you pick can be stretched to uh, come up with research. And the trick here is to build a system, but to keep your eyes open as you build the system. You use existing tools, but you keep your eyes open and say, hey, this did not work very well, or this is not good enough for some scenarios which I anticipate. Maybe it is good enough for uh, the current problem I am trying to solve, but in other cases, it may not work. Or, hey, I just hacked up some solution here. Uh, I came up with some solution quickly, so that I could build the tool. But maybe there are other better solutions. Maybe I should study alternative solutions and compare them. 
and see which works. That is research. The solutions do not necessarily have to be completely brand new solutions. They could be, you know, extensions of existing solutions. But applying them in a certain problem domain and seeing how they perform and comparing them could be a useful piece of research. It may not make it into a tier 1 conference, but it would make it into a tier 2 conference. So, finding a research area is kind of step 1. Step 2 is learning a lot about the area. In fact, step 1 and 2 are kind of iterative and I will tell you why. So, the key thing to doing research is to read up voraciously, read lots and lots of papers, everything you can lay your hand on in the area. See how other people have thought about the problems. So, uh, there is a saying which says, uh, when you do a bachelor's, you know nothing about everything, you are very broad. When you do a PhD, you know everything about nothing. In other words, your area is very narrow. So, what happens is you start with a broad area and then uh, you find a sub area uh, which looks interesting and then you read more and more in that sub area till uh, you have uh, read all the papers there are in a very narrow sub area and now you are an expert in that sub area. Now, in this process you might find uh, you know interesting things to do in that sub area and all the uh, effort you put in uh, has paid off, uh, but it may not always work out immediately. So, you may make a few iterations. So, you may then go back one step up and say okay, let me look at this other sub area and dig deeper into that. Okay. So, uh, how, but the next question is how do you learn more about an area? I said you can go read a conference papers, that is certainly one way, but sometimes it is confusing. There are lots of papers, you do not even know what the paper is about based on the title. So, how do you find relevant papers to an area that you are looking at? Uh, so, one way is uh, read a few interesting papers and if you see the papers that they refer to which are also in the same area, read them, go backwards. These days there is also an option to go forwards in the sense if you go to scholar.google.com, uh, it will tell you about papers, it will tell you about which other papers cite this paper. So, if you found a paper which you are interested in, which is say 3 years old, if you want to know has there been more work in this area, well you see what papers have been citing this paper. And if you browse through the titles uh, and you may quickly find a few new papers in that area uh, which are relevant. So, going back and forth, reading cited papers and reading papers that cite the papers that you started with, you can find a number of papers in an area and get a feel for the area. Now, again when you read a paper, uh, you should read it in two passes. The first pass is to read it quickly to get a feel for what is it, what is the paper about. You may not understand all the ideas in the paper, but you will get an idea of what the paper is trying to do. Then you can read it in a little more detail. And then if you decide it is a paper in an area you want to work on, you will actually read it in great detail and understand all the little uh, nitty gritty things which the paper addressed. Uh, this is important because that will help you when you start doing research to understand what are the issues that you need to work with. Uh, another way to do it is to find courses which have collected together interesting papers in an area. So, somebody has already done this work for you and you can find a collection of papers. Uh, there are many sources, many uh, universities have courses and they put up uh, reading lists online. For example, uh, I teach a course called advanced DBMS here, which is based entirely on reading research papers. So, I cover a number of different areas uh, to give students a feel for many areas in computer science, but I tend to focus on more on areas which I am interested in. And if you see the latest version of 632, it is on the web, uh, the links are there from Moodle. If you go to the last section of the Moodle page, uh, there are some links there. So, if you look at the most recent one, I have collected together a number of papers on query optimization and big data. So, we will see Hadoop coming up, but if you want to go beyond Hadoop, what is there? So, there are research papers covered here. But as you read those papers, you should also be thinking about innovating. So, there are people who love to read papers and they really understand papers thoroughly, but then they get stuck. They do not know what to do next. They said, look, I have read all these papers and I have understood them, but I do not know what to do. A PhD requires publication, a publication requires you to do something new. So, how do you do that? How do you innovate? The key thing is 
as you are reading papers, you should always have an inquisitive mind. Do not ever accept things as they are in the paper. People always try to act as if they have solved a problem. But most of the time, most papers have not fully solved any problem. There are always gaps. There are always assumptions which people make to get the paper out. In, in the real world, uh, any problem takes a lot of effort to solve. And it is an incremental process. Somebody solves some parts of it, writes a paper, somebody else reads this, gets ideas, solves another part of the problem and slowly it builds up to a point where there is enough knowledge to solve a real world problem. So, um, what you need to do as you read a paper is find out what are its limitations, what are the flaws. You know, maybe this technique, uh, they claim it works satisfactorily, uh, but maybe it does not in some cases. Uh, if you read uh, you know, what I consider a really excellent paper uh, from Google on big table, it has a whole bunch of wonderful ideas. At the end of the paper, they will say, uh, we do not support secondary indices because uh, we do not think anybody needs them. Uh, but maybe a few people do. We do not support transactions because we do not think anybody needs them. We have not seen enough demand for it at this point. But that is a clue right there that those are interesting areas to follow up on. And of course, Google itself followed up. They have subsequent work which looks at exactly those things which the first paper claimed was not all that important. It was important and they did go ahead and solve it in subsequent papers. So, uh, when you read a paper, look at the beauty of it, but also look at the flaws. Do not just look at the beauty and see if you can pick holes and see what you can do to address those holes. Now, when you come up with ideas for addressing those things, sometimes you know it is a brilliant new algorithm which you can publish, but most of the time that is not what happens. Most of the time what happens is you come up with a few ideas which could be useful uh, and you have to show that they actually work in some cases at least. Uh, this is very important. If you read most papers, there, is, there are a few key ideas in the paper and the rest of the paper, the paper may be 10, 12 pages, even more. Uh, 20 pages, they spend a lot of the space building up on these core ideas. So, first of all laying the groundwork, presenting the idea, uh, seeing how to apply those ideas on specific cases and then doing a performance study which shows how those ideas compare with other ideas which had been proposed earlier. So, this is a key thing in the systems area, databases is very much a systems area. So, most papers you would have to implement something and show that what you are doing works better than what others have done earlier. So, this is key. Now, all of you are faculty, uh, which is actually in a sense good because you get access to a resource that is students who can help you with uh, some of these implementation issues. So, if you get good students and uh, you know get them excited about something, they will do a very nice job of implementing. In fact, some of the good students will also ask good questions which will help you in your research uh, to find out what can be done. So, uh, do by all means involve your students in the research, give them credit where it is due. If they did work, you know make them co-authors or acknowledge them in the paper and uh, that will motivate uh, them and the future batches of students to work on these areas. So, uh, by all means use the wonderful resource which all of you have uh, to build up on your own research. Having said what all you should do, I should also uh, mention a few things you should not do. Uh, so, avoid these temptations. The first is plagiarism. Many people are tempted to uh, take some ideas which they have read somewhere and then write them up as if they came up with these ideas. That is a very bad idea today because there are so many, I mean it is always a bad idea, it is immoral. Uh, but People could get away with it in an earlier era. These days, there is no getting away with it. Uh, there are uh, tools uh, on the web which look for duplicates um, and people do use those tools. And equally important, uh, there are uh, uh, tools to find papers in an area. So, I am subscribed uh, to Google Scholar, I am subscribed to some keywords. So, whenever Google Scholar finds some papers in an area which are relevant, it thinks are relevant to my work, it sends me links to those papers and I do follow up and see what is there. And sometimes I see, hey wait a minute, I have seen exactly this thing published earlier uh, because it is an area I look at, I know what is the prior work and somebody has written a new paper which claims it is new, but this is exactly what was done earlier. 
Okay, sometimes I have to read it in detail to understand it, but more often than not, uh, you know, the uh, very initial reading, you skim the paper and you realize, look, this is identical to something I have seen, or I think I have seen this. I will Google a few key things from this paper, and lo and behold, uh, the original paper pops up, and I know that this is plagiarized. Now, today there is not sufficient punishment for plagiarism in India, uh, but it will come. You can never hide from it. Um, so, uh, recently in Germany, uh, they had a minister for higher education or something, and he was uh, thought to be in line eventually to become, uh, you know, whatever prime minister or president or in due course. But somebody found out that in his PhD thesis, and this is interesting, in Germany apparently most of the politicians have done PhDs, uh, including the current chancellor. Uh, Merkel, who has a PhD in, I think, biochemistry. Uh, she was also viewed as a good researcher. Uh, but this particular person had uh, copied something, and uh, 20 years after his PhD, somebody found out that he had plagiarized it, and he was forced to resign. His career, uh, you know, hopes for being a prime minister or whatever uh, were all dashed after that. So it will come back and bite you, if not today, 20 years from now. Because everything is out there, it is uh, indexed, it can be searched, and it will come out. You do not need to file RTI queries, it is already indexed by various search engines. Uh, so, uh, it is not a good idea to plagiarize today, because you will get caught. Uh, the other uh, temptation which people have is to publish articles in journals, which will publish anything, absolutely anything. They do not care what you have submitted. Uh, they will call it an international journal on XYZ. And uh, what is in it for them? Well, you have to pay money, and uh, then your paper gets published in that journal. Uh, all they care about is uh, getting uh, money from you for publishing it. Uh, they will say open access uh, and uh, pay uh, charges for open access, pay so many thousands of rupees, 10,000, 20,000 rupees. Um, and you publish a paper, you put it on your resume, maybe you, you get away with it. Uh, but then again, if you advance in your career, eventually somebody will find out that uh, you have been publishing in journals which have a very bad reputation for publishing anything at all without checking anything, and that will hurt your reputation eventually. If you want to uh, do well as a researcher, avoid this, because I have seen this happening to uh, some good researchers. We had, had interviews. Uh, where uh, there was a candidate who obviously knew what uh, he was talking about. He seemed quite intelligent. But if you look at the candidate's publications, several of them were in some of these uh, fake journals. Uh, and that immediately lowered our estimate of the candidate. And then when we asked the candidate, why did you publish in such journals? The candidate said, well, my advisor told me. Uh, so here is an advisor who had actually spoiled the chances of the candidate to get into a good uh, job, because uh, people recognize that some of the publications were in really bad places. So again, avoid this temptation. Uh, these things are known informally today, uh, but sooner or later there will be whitelists and blacklists, and some of these will show up in blacklists, and people will check against these. Okay, that is it from me, and now let us take questions. We have NPR College, please go ahead. Sir, uh, very happy to uh, hear that uh, uh, the topic related to research areas, and we have that uh, one single question is, uh, so what is it emerging areas uh, in research in DBMS? Okay. So fair enough. The question is, uh, what do I think are some emerging areas in uh, database research? Uh, so uh, there are uh, many interesting areas. I uh, will tell you about some of the areas which I am looking at, because I am familiar uh, with those areas. Uh, one of the areas is uh, big data. Mm, so, uh, there has been a lot of work on big data. Uh, and uh, what has happened in that area is, it started off with, uh, like databases did initially, it started off with file systems and uh, programs to parallel processing systems based on Hadoop to work with data and file systems. And it's now evolved back to being relational uh, data bases have come back in this area. Query languages have come back. Query optimization has come back. Uh, but I think there are still interesting things to do on how to 
uh, actually run queries in such a setting. Um, and more important, uh, given that you have a parallel processing infrastructure, how do you uh, solve problems using this infrastructure, which maybe you would have done in a different way earlier on. Uh, so already in the context of data mining research, people uh, are taking all the old data mining algorithms and saying, can we redo uh, them to work efficiently on this Hadoop and similar other parallel processing infrastructure. Uh, the same kind of things could be asked of uh, many other uh, situations. Um, how do you uh, do maybe view maintenance? How do you partition a database uh, uh, and to, to make it scalable along with all the other goodies which you want in databases, uh, recovery, uh, concurrency control, and so on. So that's a current area of interest. Uh, and we are working specifically on some query optimization angle to this. A second area of interest is on unstructured or semi-structured data. So uh, there's a lot of data in text files, web pages, and so forth. But more recently, uh, there's been a lot of uh, work on uh, RDF, which is basically a data representation format, uh, which you could, in some sense, you can think of it as a successor to XML. XML was tree structured. RDF is arbitrary graph structure. And it's typically thought of as, uh, you can think of it as a graph, where there are nodes uh, and there are edges. Um, so, or you can think of it as a number of facts. Uh, fact is uh, something like subject, predicate object. Something like uh, a subject could be a person, which is somehow identified uniquely. The predicate could be name, and the object could be the name of the person. The predicate could be institution where the person worked, and the object could be uh, object representing the institution where they worked. So think of it as an entity relationship model. Uh, so you can think of the world as having a number of entities and relationships between them. So people have generated a lot of RDF data from many sources, some of it from relational data sources, some of it is uh, taken by extracting information from text. There's a lot of data out there, huge amounts of data. There are billions of uh, tuples of RDF data out there. And how do you uh, run queries on them? How do you efficiently process queries? Uh, the issue here is that uh, if you think of it as uh, in a relational form, where each predicate is a relation, then there are millions of relations. You can't use the normal relational database techniques. They don't scale to millions of relations. Uh, but it's not unstructured either. It is partially structured. So there's uh, been uh, interesting work in recent years on how to index and process queries on them. Uh, and I think there's a lot of future here. As queries go, grow more complex, how can you process them on such kinds of data? How do you process complex queries? So I think that's a rich source. Um, then just keyword queries on uh, graph structured data. That's a project we have had for many years. Uh, there's been a lot of work which has happened in the last uh, 10, 15 years in this area. But I think there is still a little bit of work left in that uh, when you deal with web scale processing. Uh, then data mining is a very big area. There are many sub areas. Um, so I won't talk about it because that's not my research area. Uh, but uh, there are uh, many people, I'm sure, here who are probably working in data mining related areas. It's very closely related to databases. Um, but I, I will not speak uh, for that area. But I, I know that there's plenty of areas uh, to be waiting to be explored there. Uh, within databases, what are the other areas which are active? Um, there are many areas. If you go to uh, the proceedings of any recent conference, look at the session titles, you will find stuff that is going on. How to do transaction processing in a highly parallel way. How to do uh, transaction processing efficiently uh, on uh, multiple, across multiple machines, uh, in particular with main memory resident data. Um, and then there are some other uh, areas which are kind of emerging. For example, testing. So people build database systems. How do you trust them? How do you test that they are actually working and doing what they're supposed to do? People have built database applications. How do you trust that they are working correct? What if they are uh, giving you wrong results and you make wrong business decisions based on wrong results? How do you know it's doing the right thing? How do you test <coughs> these applications? How do you generate test data for testing applications? That's a, a rich area. 
that is also an area where we have done some initial work. Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier. How do you check if a student query is correct by generating multiple data sets? That is part of this broader area on uh, generating uh, test data and also approaches to testing uh, applications and database systems. Uh, there are many more areas. I, I won't try to list them. I will go read it up by browsing conferences. Does that answer your question? Thank you, sir. Another question, sir. So, what are the different methodology adapted for transaction and uh, real-time database, sir? Okay. Question is about uh, real-time databases. Mm, so, uh, real-time databases you can think of in different ways. One way is, the, you know, uh, you want results reasonably quickly. That's what many people think real-time is. If you ask a question, you get it back interactively. Uh, the real-time database community or real-time systems community does not consider this real-time. What they consider real-time is when you can give guarantees about how quickly the results will come. And the motivating applications for these are often in embedded systems. You have a self-driving car. It had better make a decision of whether to uh, go straight or turn right uh, before it uh, actually uh, comes to the intersection in the road. And if it sees something ahead of it, it had better make a decision to stop before it's too late and it's going to crash into that or to slow down. So all of these are real-time decisions which have to be made within certain deadlines. Uh, so there was a lot of old work on real-time uh, databases. In fact, uh, the foremost expert in that area internationally is a professor called Kriti Ramamritam, who is my colleague here. So if you want to know more about work in that area, maybe you should get in touch with him. So again, uh, what is current active research in real-time databases, uh, I am not very sure uh, what is going on. I do not think Kriti himself is working actively in real-time databases per se, but he is doing a lot of work on real-time systems overall, uh, including uh, power uh, grid monitoring and reaction to uh, things which happen on power networks. So there is a lot of real-time components here. And there is a huge data angle also because many of these things generate enormous volumes of data and you may need to make decisions taking into account lots of data. But what are the research issues here? I am not sure. You can get in touch with him. Jain to you, Hyderabad. Yes, sir. Uh, the first question on research, sir. Uh, since uh, I am a beginner in the research area, so I would also like to start publishing some papers, uh, but before publishing the papers, mm. I would uh, you know, like to do some uh, literature survey. So for that, yeah. I want to find out the impact factor of a journal and uh, find out how good is a paper or not. So mm. I would like to know details about the impact factor of the journal or which journal is a good journal to choose my paper from and what is the minimum value of an impact factor that I have to take into consideration. And uh, also if you can suggest some good international journals wherein I can search for papers and publish my papers later on. That will be great, sir. And also, uh, something about the ISO certification of the journal. So that's the first question on research. Okay. Uh, I'll come back to you later uh, regarding the teaching uh, question part. So if you can answer the research question first. Oh, uh, fair enough. So this is a good question. What journal should we be reading papers from? And what journal should we be targeting for publishing papers? Uh, so in the computer science community, traditionally, a uh, lot of the focus has been on conferences more than on journals. And uh, that is still true today. Uh, if you want to find out the uh, latest interesting stuff that is happening, your first bet is to look for uh, leading conferences. What most people do is first they publish uh, ideas in a conference and then they refine the ideas, you know, uh, dot the i's, cross the t's, uh, you know, extend the ideas a little bit and publish that in journals uh, if they wish to. But then many ideas are never published in journals. They are only published in conferences. And that is the reason if you see the, uh, when I said uh, look at these top uh, tier 1, uh, 2, 3 conferences, I said conferences. I did not say journals. The reason I did not say journals is not because there are not good journals, uh, but because uh, the hottest ideas tend to get published first in conferences and later appear after some time in journals. Uh, that said, uh, there are many journals. How do you pick journals? Um, so there has been a lot of uh, analysis on impact factors and so on. Uh, some of these metrics which judge impact factors are uh, uh, kind of to some extent questionable metrics. Uh, 
so it's a perfectly good journal, uh, the very large database journal. Uh, one year its impact factor was so high that it ranked among the top journals in computer science. Uh, the next year its impact factor went down sharply and you say why, you know nothing has changed sir, excellent journal, uh, what changed? It turns out that the, in a particular year there were two or three very highly cited papers and those two or three papers boosted the impact factor of the journal tremendously. But the metrics for impact factor only take into account papers in the last few years. Once that window passed, those few very highly cited papers vanished from the window, uh, the impact factor of the journal came down sharply. That does not mean it is any worse or better a journal. Uh, so, I would uh, to some extent question how this impact factor is defined that leads to problems. Uh, that said, of course, the impact factor does mean something, if not the exact value. So, um, one way to do it is uh, to see how people have ranked this. So, there have been a few uh, efforts in this direction. Uh, in, in Australia, uh, there was an effort to rank uh, both conferences and journals into different categories. They had A or A plus, B, C and so forth. Uh, these are based on people's perceptions of these, uh, not just on raw uh, numbers like impact factor. Um, of course, there is a bias in uh, how people do this. Uh, there are some sites which should be included or rank lower than they should be and vice versa. But if you are looking for uh, places which tend to publish good papers, uh, it is worth going at this. It is called the Australian core ranking, C-O-R-E, core ranking, Australian core ranking. So, if you uh, search that on uh, the net, you will uh, find their site and then you can go in. The thing is that uh, they rank all areas of computer science. Uh, not just databases. So, if you want databases, I have put up a few and I will put up uh, some more in the journal side of things. Um, but then you can go to the core ranking and dig deeper. Similarly, for other sub areas, data mining, they, they actually have ranked it by area also. So, it is a good source to find what are the uh, top and the next tier conferences and journals. Um, now, if you want to publish in these things, you have to uh, first of all. Uh, do not worry about uh, where to publish. Your first step is to really understand an area and uh, you know absorb the techniques which people have proposed. At the same time, you keep questioning how you what they have done and see how you can improve it. That should be your first goal. Once you have some ideas on how to do something different or better, uh, you start uh, thinking about it, uh, write down the ideas tentatively. Then you start thinking about how to show that your ideas work. Uh, what kind of a system to put them into, how do you, what, what kind of database or query or other benchmark you should use to compare your ideas with others. And so, you start putting together the systems, build it, uh, you know, compare with others and write this up, you have a paper. Around this point, you should be worrying about where to send that paper. Uh, so, uh, that is not an easy question to answer. Uh, if you feel that what you have is a really new idea, there is some real, something which you are really excited about, uh, which you think others will also be excited about, then target a top notch conference. If you think what you have done is interesting, it is uh, something which uh, people may be interested in, but you are not sure, uh, you know, if it is a really top notch idea, sometimes it is okay to send it to a conference and see what feedback people have. People may say this idea is trivial people may say it is not bad, but it is not good enough for this conference or to your surprise people may say hey this is a good idea, accept it. Uh, any of these could happen. It is okay to send papers like this to get feedback, you should not overdo it, but it is okay to sometimes send a paper to a good conference. Um, but then you should have a feel uh, for where it has a chance and target conferences or journals which are at the appropriate level. Uh, you do not want to uh, sink to the level of journals which will accept any papers, uh, there is no point publishing in such journals except if you uh, desperately need a PhD and uh, somebody is ticking the number of publications you have without caring for the venue and you need your PhD desperately, fine. But that is not about research, that is about getting a degree. If you want to do research and have your work recognized by others. Uh, try to get it into as good a place as it can get into. That is how others will notice your work. And when others notice your work, citations come in and then there are various metrics which 
can be used to judge the quality of your work. Did that answer your question? Okay, and uh, we have a couple of other questions, sir. Okay. Uh, among them, the first question would be uh, from a teaching point of view, sir. Uh, from the feedback which I got from the students, sir, uh, they feel that the topic of relational algebra, tuple relational calculus, domain relational calculus, mm -hmm. it's kind of boring or, you know, most of the students tend not to listen to that particular topic. Yeah. So, how do I make it interesting and teach them the topics and uh, how do I differentiate between the tuple relational calculus and domain relational calculus? If you okay. could throw some light on that, it will be great. Too. Okay. Uh, if you have control on the syllabus, uh, like uh, we do, we are lucky enough to do at IIT Bombay, uh, I do not even cover it in any detail. I just spend one lecture uh, introducing them to it and that is it. I, uh, in terms of the calculus. Okay, so, I have that uh, flexibility and I do realize that people get bored, uh, you know, why should we do this, what is, in, uh, what, what is so interesting about it. There will be a few very theoretically inclined students who actually find it fascinating, but for most people, yes, uh, what you are saying is true. Uh, the relational calculus is, uh, sorry, relational algebra is different and uh, here it is actually very important for the underlying implementation. And if you link up relational algebra to SQL, uh, it actually helps people understand what an SQL query does. So that linkage will help them uh, get motivated. So again, the way uh, we teach it now is to first introduce people to the concepts of, uh, you know, the various operations, join, just the way I taught it here, right? I just very quickly covered uh, all the basic relational algebra operators, uh, exposing uh, you to it. I did not make you write uh, complex queries in relational algebra. Uh, that is optional uh, because that is not how people do things, but it is still a good exercise to help people understand how to write queries. In fact, I do make my students, I, I did not do it here, but in my course at IIT Bombay, I do make students write some non-trivial queries in relational algebra to get, uh, to help them get a feel for it. And they find this interesting. It is not that they find that boring. And later on, the connections with the implementations of the query uh, processing system will become clear um, and that also helps keep them motivated. Yes, sir. One more question regarding teaching. Why do not we cover the development of database management system software? Uh, if not, I understand it is very complex task, mm -hmm. but uh, even if we could do some part of it uh, then by maybe by some simulators or something, mm -hmm. then if it would be advantageous and uh, is there any research scope in that? And uh, if we have to do it, how would we start doing, uh, teaching students how to develop a new DBMS? Okay. Uh, that is a good question. Uh, there are uh, several possible responses to it. Uh, the way this was done in Wisconsin where I did my PhD uh, was to have a course where uh, they would provide an API for various layers of a database system. And people had to build this uh, from bottom up. They had to build the code to implement the lowest level API. Uh, once uh, that was working and they, they would provide test programs to test that level. After you clear those test programs, you build the next layer up. Like you start from the storage manager, uh, then you build indexing, then you build a very simple SQL engine. Uh, and then I do not remember if they did concurrency control. Maybe they stopped at the SQL engine. So they built a few layers of a real database system. It was a toy, nothing in it, uh, they, you know, you can't actually do everything in a real system in one single course. But that was a very database implementation intensive course. It was a course by itself. So it, it does take effort to do it. Uh, when we started teaching it here in IIT Bombay, there was another colleague of mine who also did his PhD with me in Wisconsin. Uh, he had come, uh, he had joined IIT Bombay earlier. He left later on. Uh, so he uh, w did a similar thing here. But after a few years, we found that asking students to build the same thing over and over again, uh, it was very difficult uh, since the same system, same API, people would just get code from their seniors and submit it as their own. They would not take it seriously. They were not learning because they were taking shortcuts. It was difficult to uh, check this. Uh, so we uh, took a slightly different approach. We have an internal scores, a database internal scores, where we no longer use a toy system, we use PostgreSQL. Uh, so, we actually have students do projects which go and modify parts of PostgreSQL to add some functionality or change how it does something. Uh, and that is actually very nice because this is a real system. 
uh, they are exposed to an actual real system and the intricacies of it. There is a flip side that it is a complex system, it takes time to understand and if you have a single course which covers uh, starting from SQL and uh, so on all the way into internals, there is no time for all of this. So, I do not get into that in my first course, I only cover it in a uh, separate internals course. And uh, PostgreSQL is a wonderful resource that you can essentially uh, you know dig into it and modify uh, it to do say query processing, indexing, storage, there are so many things you can go munge around with and actually implement and show it working. Um, we have a list of projects which uh, we suggest to our students, you know I will be happy to share that if anybody wants to run such a course. This is Vaishnav Institute. Yes, so, sir, my question is regarding the quality of journals. Uh, is there any certifying authority who can measure that whether the journal is fake or not? If it exists, then what procedure it follows? Okay. Uh, that is a good question. Unfortunately, there is no uh, such certifying authority that I am aware of. But the closest is uh, the Australian core rankings which say that these are good places. What we do not have is something which say these are bad places. This is something which uh, I and some colleagues have been tossing around, you know, should we get into this exercise of uh, listing uh, journals which are bad um, and urge people not to submit papers there. Uh, that is something we have been thinking about. We, if we get the time to do it, we may do it at some point. Uh, but if you uh, find a place listed in the core rankings, that is probably a good place. So, at least you have a a uh, positive list and we do not have a negative list as of now. Next we have Sanmuga I think. Yeah. Is it possible to store databases as uh, graphs? Can you uh, give us ideas sir? Data uh, bases as graphs, is it? graph data. Is that your question? Yes sir, yes. Yeah. So, this is actually a very hot topic uh, currently. Uh, there are extremely large graphs available today. If you uh, look at Facebook data, there are uh, you know I think a billion people on Facebook and each of them has lots of friends. So, it is a graph with a billion nodes and uh, the number of edges is uh, every uh, you know friend relationship is an edge. So, the uh, Facebook has an enormous graph. Uh, that is just one example. There are many other uh, examples of uh, graph data which are really large the very much big data realm. Uh, so, now there has been a lot of work on how do you process uh, queries on such graph data. There have been papers from Google uh, system called Pregel and then there is uh, another uh, one which has come out and then there are some open source systems uh, all trying to figure out how to deal with such big graphs. Uh, then there has been work on how to partition uh, very large graphs to break them up. Uh, so, it is a uh, good area which is uh, there is a lot of interest in it currently because the big data techniques are available now and uh, also very big graphs are now real and uh, how to do interesting stuff on such large graphs is an active area. Okay. Now, I uh, will take a couple of uh, topics from chat. Somebody asked up to what extent plagiarism is accepted and I would say 0. What do I mean by 0 plagiarism? Now, when you write a paper, there are definitions uh, which you have read and you want to use the same definition in your work. What you need to do is you can use the definition, but you have to say that you know we use the following definition from this paper. So, what you are doing is uh, you are not copying it and not acknowledging it. You are saying that uh, you know you are setting up the stage for your work and saying that this is past work, this is how people have defined it. You may even describe a prior algorithm and say this is how that algorithm works. In all such cases, you are citing it. You are saying that uh, th this is the paper which described the idea and this is how they did it. And uh, when you are uh, describing uh, you know definitions and maybe algorithm, sometimes you have to take it as is. Uh, but anything else, you sh should put it in your own words. It should not be. Uh, taken verbatim, you cannot just take uh, paragraphs from somebody else's work or even sentences from other people's work and put them into your paper without citation. You, so, the only things which you can copy as is are things like definitions and algorithms which you cannot change and they should be properly cited saying that it is clearly saying that 
we took it from there. Then you should make clear what you have done you. If you follow this, then it is not plagiarism. But if you just take paragraphs from some paper uh, and uh, it is not clear that it is work which you have taken from somewhere else, then that is plagiarism. And uh, there is essentially zero tolerance for that. Uh, then the next one is impact factor confuses a lot. What is the highest impact factor? Uh, you know, how do you choose this? It is a complete mess. Impact factor is a, like I said, a very uh, questionable metric in some sense. Uh, if you take raw numbers, uh, as, as I said, impact factors go up and down. Yes, the best journals do have the highest impact factors and uh, the worst ones may not have very good impact factors at all. Uh, but in between, uh, it is very difficult to take Im impact factors as a raw number and what to do with it. Like I said, you are better off uh, looking at these uh, rankings like the Australian core ranking to decide uh, where something fits. Is it tier 1, tier 2, tier 3? These are all considered acceptable. Tier 3 is still considered good. Uh, and then there is uh, maybe tier 4, which is considered not so good workshops, which still do publish something interesting. And after that, uh, you know, it is unranked, meaning uh, they do not uh, consider either they do not know about it, that can be. There are perfectly good things they do not know about. Uh, but also, it may be something which uh, is not considered really good. Uh, there is also a whole other class of workshops. Uh, which are a good way to publish initial results. So, typically what happens is every conference has a number of workshops associated with it. The workshops themselves may not have a very uh, high ranking. They may not even be ranked in these rankings. Uh, but they are a good place to publish work initially, get feedback, uh, talk with others working in the area. And later on you can extend the work and publish it in a higher rank conference. So, uh, you, you should consider publishing in workshops, which are part of larger higher rank conferences. Another question is, is it okay if we publish literature reviews in leading journals? Um, this is a harder question. You know, some journals do accept surveys in an area uh, and they generally do it in an area which uh, maybe is considered new and they want people to know more about it. But it can easily degenerate because, you know, if, if you take every MTech student here, has to do a seminar, which is basically a literature survey of some area. Now, we could take every single MTech seminar report and publish it as a literature survey of some sub area. Uh, is it worth publishing? Uh, you know, uh, that is questionable. It has to be large enough and uh, should, uh, you know, have some value to be considered a publication worthy of being counted against your name. You could put it up on your website and make it available to others. That is a good way. So, our seminar students reports are used by other students who want to learn more about the idea. So, they are used, uh, but I would not consider them as a true publication. Okay, uh, I will take the last few live questions. Rajam Bapu Institute. Sir, a query regarding development of application hmm. uh, database that contains uh, around 25 lakhs of faculty information. Sir. So, we want to develop an application that contains all faculties of India at one place. So, could you suggest me a design on this database where we should go for a split kind of thing which contains several tables or should we go for a single table that has several attributes and so on? Uh, so, we have covered ER modeling. You should apply it to your domain. You should first of all decide what all you want to record. Uh, then you should uh, do an ER uh, modeling of that. And that will uh, lead you to whatever is the correct solution. It is all a function of what all you want to record. And then what all you want to do with that data. You know, what is the use of compiling a list of uh, 25 lakh faculty? What is the use? Who is going to give you the data? What is going to happen to that data afterwards? That should be something interesting which one can do with the data you have collected. So, you should be thinking about that even before you start any data collection exercise. And then uh, that will lead you naturally to the schema which you should be using. Uh, Sarvajani College, Surat. Uh, can, you, can you throw some light on to research possibilities in the area of database testing and uh, database refactoring? Okay. Uh, database testing and refactoring. So, refactoring I do not have much to say. Uh, testing definitely. Uh, so, uh, there are uh, many uh, sub areas in uh, database testing. Uh, one kind of testing is uh, how does this perform under load? Um, so, some of it is not necessarily research, uh, but 
some things in this are in the domain of research. So, how do you generate data sets of sufficient size which, which satisfy some properties? And the problem here is that sometimes there are data sets of large size which are available uh, like say banking data and so on, but nobody is going to give you that data. It is considered secret, there is no way they will give it to you. But you might be able to get some information about the data, what are the sizes, what are some properties, how is the distributions of uh, transactions and so forth. And then the goal is to generate data sets which uh, respect those properties in terms of load distribution, size distributions and so forth. Uh, so, how do you do that? How do you generate such data sets? How do you generate really large data sets uh, at big data scale in parallel? So, there has been a lot of interesting research in recent years on this topic. Uh, so, that is one side, generating uh, data sets which have some properties. Another uh, area which I had already mentioned is how do you generate data sets that can help you check the correctness of queries. Uh, so, th there has been, uh, we have done some initial research in this area and there have been a few others, but there is a lot more to be done here. It is still in its infancy. Uh, in particular uh, complex queries, applications um, and so forth. So, there is definitely work to be done in this area. Uh, then there is testing of database systems themselves. How do you know the database implementation is actually working correctly? Uh, another kind of testing is uh, with respect to concurrency. This is actually a big headache because it is very hard to uh, debug a system and say that it will work fine when things are done concurrently. Things can and will fail if you do not code your system properly. So, how do you do uh, testing of uh, such systems where concurrent accesses can cause trouble? So, can you build tools which will help you stress your uh, application and expose concurrency problems? Uh, that would be a very interesting thing. You know, I, uh, we have done some initial work here on that uh, by analyzing the database queries and transactions that are generated by an application. Uh, but that was very preliminary work and there is a lot more work to be done here. Uh, and these are problems which we actually see, you know, things going wrong. Uh, can you build a tool which can test an application to see if it is vulnerable to such race conditions? Um, that is an interesting area. People have also been looking at it from a different angle. Can you take an application and prove that it is safe? Uh, so, there has been some work from Microsoft research in Bangalore in this context. Um, so, if you cannot uh, prove it is safe, uh, maybe you should change something uh, which will then allow the system to show that it is safe. Uh, or sometimes they say that let us declaratively specify what we want and the system will generate the required uh, semaphores or whatever concurrency control mechanism which will ensure safety. So, there are many different approaches to this. Um, databases have inspired some of these things because the notion of transaction is very powerful. Uh, so, people have been trying to use this notion of transaction to build other uh, parallel systems, which are not database systems per se. So, there is a lot of ongoing research in all these areas. So, testing of these systems is pretty important. Any follow up question? Yeah, uh, sir, can you throw some light on to research areas in data warehouse schema designing? Research in data warehouse schema design. I do not know if that is an active area of research currently. There was a lot of work on warehousing a uh, while ago. Um, I am not aware of what is current work in this area. Now, big data has certainly uh, made a lot of changes to how we are doing things. Uh, the sources of data are different today from what it was a while ago. The volume of data is different. Uh, the systems which are used to manage big data are different from the old systems. So, how do you do uh, you know like extract transform loading in parallel with very large data sources. So, there are interesting issues which uh, are going to reappear in the big data context. So, whatever work was done earlier uh, is going to be revisited and looked at again in the big data context. So, there will be work, but specifically schema design I do not know. Thank you.